Hello and welcome to the final stage. This is stage eight of the Tour de l'Avenir. It's been a magnificent week of racing. We're now into the mountains, well into the mountains, in fact. And today on the menu, the final dish is a 99.6 kilometer stage, starting in Valsigny Terminion and finishing atop saint foy tarentaise another mountain top finish. But right now, as you can see, we have two riders on tête climbing the mighty all category climb the highest point of this year's tour de l'avenir climbs to over 2770 meters above sea level it is the col de Isarin, 12.8 k's at 7.3 percent uh, two riders out in front the effervescent joshua golica of great britain who sits in second position there in the white jersey and emblet svestad Bardseng uh, from norway just a little bit of housekeeping, of course, before we move into this final decisive stage. As we look at the time gap, the pair out in front have a one-minute lead on the remnants of the peloton, which we understand is only around 35 to 40 riders strong. But it is still Matthew Riccitello who leads this race after yesterday's stage. That was the uh, result of stage 7B. We had a time trial in the morning. Archie Ron of Ireland took a magnificent win. After a challenging season ahead of Isaac del Toro, who moved himself in the process into second place overall, the Mexican rider. And then uh, in the third place, uh, Julio Pelizari. He sits at, sorry, Sir David Pelagnoli, should I say, sits third at 105. His teammate is now fourth at 207. Forgive us for the slight picture break up here. Unsurprising in the mountains, the weather has closed in. The temperature at the top of the Col de Isarin is pretty nippy, 7 degrees. But thankfully, right now, as you can see, it isn't raining. These are live pictures from the top of the highest point of this year's Tour de l'Avenir. But yet, yeah, Matthew Ritticello um, came under a lot of pressure on the, the stage yesterday. Um, was isolated quite early on to the finish at Val at Cine. But the Irishman Archie Ryan that took advantage, attacked with about 5k to go from the top of the climb and one solo. Still struggling to get your pitches. Um, but uh, as you see, we uh, were forecast a lot of rain today, but thankfully that is not the case. But off the top of this beautiful climb of the Corda Isaram, we have a very, very long descent. So thankfully the rain has abated. Hopefully the riders will experience a dry and a safe descent. It's a good 10 or 12 k's. They reach a plateau, drop down again into the valley, and then there's two climbs towards the end of today's stage, which will make a big difference, I feel. The Monte du Villaret, 8.5 k's at 5.8%. They crest that at 90 k's in, drop down, and then there's a final haul to the line at saint foy tarentaise So I'll bring in my co-commentator. He's been with me for the entire week. It's been a lot of fun commentating on this brilliant race with Jens Decker. But Jens, final stage today. Matthew Riccitello still looking good in the yellow jersey. His lead has been narrowed a little bit. Um, what are your thoughts on how today may unfold? As briefly, we just look at the general classification. There is Riccitello leading by 54 seconds. Uh, Piganzoli second. Third, shall I say, 105. Pelizari there fourth. Emil Rondel, Le Cerf, Pinzon. And the rest... The top 10 now separated uh, by 4 minutes and 8 seconds. Um, so a very, very different looking general classification than the previous week. Anders Voldegep still holding on, in fact, was equal on points to Isaac Del Toro. He's wearing that today. I have a feeling that may change today. It's certainly not a day for the man in the green jersey. Uh, definitely a day for the Mexican who poses, I think, a serious, serious threat. But... There we go. Isaac Del Toro also leads the Kingdom Mountains classification. A lot more points on offer today as well. 20 points atop of the Col de Isaran. And then he also leads the best young rider as well with a 1 minute 13 seconds lead over Pelizari and Rondel, previous leader of that classification, in third as we look at the finish line. So we'll get pictures to you as soon as we can. I'll reintroduce uh, Jens Decker. Jens, it's been a, a brilliant race so far, but it's by no means a done deal, is it? No, it absolutely isn't. Riccatel is uh, under definite pressure from the two Italians who uh, who could work together in the final of the, today's stage to uh, uh, um, 
on seat, Riccitello, uh, and then Del Toro, of course, has been brilliant this entire race, and uh, he has the potential of winning all the jerseys, actually, uh, which uh, which will be an interesting feat, but then uh, first he needs to take back roughly a minute on, uh, on the American, which is going to be difficult, but there is certainly the terrain to do it today with, uh, well, they're still on the Iseron, which is one of the hardest climbs in the Alps, uh, going up to uh, over 2,700 meters, uh, then a long descent, and then two short but steep climbs at the end. Yeah, the final climb to saint foy Tarentaise, we just saw the finish line a moment ago, as uh, Jens was just saying, is very steep. It's a short one, 4.9 k's, but 8.7%. That will really sort things out. Not quite as difficult as uh, the last couple of stages, um, especially uh, the stage we had on stage uh, six, should I say. Two split stages yesterday when we climbed the Col de la Loz, and that was won by the Mexican Isaac del Toro, who sits in second place at 54 seconds, um, taking, I think it was about 17 seconds off the lead of our American rider, who was isolated very early on. Um, but the, uh, there is the terrain. We are nearly at the top, probably a couple of k's from the top of the Col de Isaran at the moment. Our two riders are still clear with a nice lead of around a minute, but just look at the amount of descending there is on the menu and why we were stressing that uh, we're both pretty pleased I think it's fair to say all the team managers the race organizers will have breathed a sigh of relief that we've got dry yet chilly conditions and no surprise it's cold we are uh, just not far away from 3,000 meters above sea level as we uh, return to the race just under an hour and 20 minutes of racing so far and the reasons for our picture breakup we are running on a 4G transmission here so we uh, it's telecommunications wise and we'll get pictures as soon as possible. But they're not too far from the top of the Col de Isaran. And then, Jens, they've got that exceptionally long descent, which will um, be a real test, won't it, for these young riders. Uh, for the first proper time in the Tour de l'Avenir of how they descend on these alpine descents. Yeah, we haven't had any descents where uh, there was the potential for anyone to really be put under pressure. And even so, we did see some gaps yesterday on the very limited amount of descending that we did have. So uh, there is some potential to do something on that descent. I think uh, if we're looking at the top of the general classification, uh, Del Toro has that mountain bike cyclocross experience. He, he will know how to go downhill very fast. Um, he's one to look for to, to put the other riders under pressure. But it's not just about technical descending because there is that longer flat section in the middle of the descent and then, uh, then then there's also some wider roads not too technical at the bottom so it'll be about aerodynamics finding a good group to work with as well if you're stuck in your own in that descent it's going to be hard um, but first we'll have to see what happens on the actual climb uh, as much as we're going to see because uh, the connection is, uh, is obviously not great um, but here's a look back at what happened yesterday yep this is the um, start of yesterday's stage uh, the one ultimately taken um, by the Irishman. It was a fast start. The uh, neutralised section was neutralised in a different way because of the wet start and the, uh, the long descent to the Depart Fictif, or from the Depart Fictif to the Depart Real. They went down in vehicles. And the first real kicker of the day, um, which was a change to the planned route, um, actually split the peloton here. And this is the group that went clear, put a lot of pressure on the young American, who uh, was completely isolated, no teammates around, and was forced to chase behind. The other significant team which missed the split yesterday morning was France. He did receive a little bit of assistance from France, but the lead went out to the group in front to around 30 seconds. It was then that Riccitello decided to take things into his own hands and drive across the gap. He did get across the gap, and from that point onward, looks relatively settled. Belgium then took it up, but it was about 5 k from the top of the climb, with around 9 or 10 k to go in total that Archie Ryan took flight and ultimately won the stage. But back to the present day, back to the final stage of the Tour de l'Avenir. A little tussle for points over the top. Looks like Golica took a late lunge there. I think Svestad Barsing thought he got that one. But a late little surge from Golica, that could prove pretty helpful. That was 20 points um, in the King of the Mountains situation there for Golica. Remember, though, that the Mexican del Toro does have 39 a pretty superior lead. And here we go. These are the slopes of the Izaran. And as you can see, not much margin for error. And this is a long, long descent. So I think, Jens, it's a case of hold on to your hats and let's see how these young riders perform. Let's see how agile they are. Let's see um, if they can hold their nerve on this long descent. But I think you'll echo my sentiments here. I'm, I'm so, so glad it's dry for these riders today. 
Yeah, both uh, Svejstad and Golik are not right up there in the man classification, but Svejstad has 23 points, uh, and Golik had 10 points at the start of the day. Um, Del Toro at 51, so that's uh, still quite a long way away. I don't think he's going to be caught in that classification unless something uh, strange happens. But Svejstad, the uh, the Norwegian, Golik, the, the young British rider, they're going downhill now, um, and it's well, we're seeing Golik looks a little bit under pressure from the, uh, the slightly older rider. He's only two years older. Uh, than Golikar, of course, because um, both all the all the riders in this race, of course, very young. But uh, Golikar, especially young, as a as a first year under 23. Yeah, Golikar just allowing, or well, not able to keep with Svestad Barsing just now. Um, the gap that you're seeing now is more than just laying off the wheel. He cannot descend at quite the same speed as the man in front. Um, but using these little flatter sections to try and get on top of the gear but right now it is the Norwegian who's just descending with a bit more pace there's the lead to the peloton behind which unsurprisingly has completely fractured it was team Columbia who were riding earlier on for the vast majority of the climb we understand looking after Edgar Pinzon who moved up the general classification yesterday he started the day in 10th position and has moved up uh, taking two seconds back actually on uh, the race lead, but still sits at 4.06, but it's now moved up to seventh place. But uh, Golica here losing a little bit of time, just a couple of seconds, but it's so, it's so important here, isn't it? It's easy to sit back, Jens, isn't it, and criticize riders on descents. Oh, why can't they just keep the wheel? But look at, we don't need to go into detail about what happens th this year and, and, and the and the perils that, that around pretty much every corner in a professional bike race, out training and out on the road. But riders have to ride within their comfort zone, don't they? And that's enormously important. And that is exactly what we're seeing here. Um, Golica will pull back on the flatter sections if he can. But um, given the terrain and given the relative unfamiliarity, it's all about making sure that you're comfortable on the bike, isn't it? Yeah, it is a dangerous sport. That's, uh, that's for certain. And I think Golica... We know he's uh, he's slightly less experienced, certainly at this uh, this kind of descending at this level uh, of racing. Uh, Golikar hasn't done any uh, any big professional races, whereas Svejstad has been a professional this year at Human Powered Health, um, which um, which incidentally is a team that is uh, is probably coming to an end this year. So he is riding yeah. for a contract, uh, which might be a reason why he's on the attack today. But. Uh, yeah, Golikar maybe just hasn't got the experience yet, and and this, you know, he has to just do this, do this a couple times, maybe uh, come back here next year, do the same kind of descents, and gain confidence that way. Uh, this looks like it's the second group on the road. I think it's one of the Italians, but um, it's a, quite a disjointed image. I'm not quite sure who that was, and uh, if there are still riders in between, or if there's a couple of riders who've attacked from the peloton, uh, trying to get across to these riders. Yeah, certainly a rider who's caked up. You can just see Golica has decided uh, not to uh, put a cape on. He's pretty happy. There'll be... Oh, there it is, the rider who's attacked the rest. That looked like the Mexican in between. So this, this little group of riders has been led by Isak Del Toro. He's in the King of the Mountains jersey. I'm trying to see where Riccicello is. There he is in the yellow jersey. So just with Archie Ryan just behind as well. And it looked like the Belgian William Juni Le Cerf was also there as well. His blue jersey just visible under his uh, black cape flapping in the wind. But look at the dramatic scenery here as Golica banks into another corner, knee out, MotoGP style, back on the gears again. Um, the lead is steady, doesn't it? He's now descending at or around the same pace as Svedstein Barsing, which suggests that Golica has finally now got into that rhythm that he's comfortable with. Yeah, I, I would even say he's not a bad descender at all. He's maybe not the fastest going downhill, but Svejstad uh, is just motoring away on these corners, taking slightly more risk, and that just pulls out a few seconds every corner. Uh, but just looking back to that group, it looked like Del Toro might have attacked over the top of the Isaran, yeah. uh, maybe going for those mountain points, but maybe also just putting uh, putting Ricatello on the pressure. I think it's Billy Zari who's following here. Uh, just looks like his style. And they've got a couple seconds on the rest of that group, and it looked like uh, Lesser was the rider leading that group through. Um, just trying to look back through who, uh, who, there, who was there. We saw Riccatello definitely there, Archie Ryan as well, and I think uh, Pigonzoli must have been in that group as well. And um, just as um, was one of the Colombians, so that was probably Pinzon uh, who got into that group. But all the other riders seem to have dropped away from uh, from the group of the yellow jersey. So uh, there's there's some movement being uh, made in the general classification. 
Yeah, there's a. Just trying to look and see if we can find any more information for you. But uh, no, you're quite right. We did see uh, definitely Archie Ryan there. As we continue our plummet off the top of the cold at Isaran, losing elevation and uh, clicking the kilometres by very quickly indeed. And there's the drops off to your left. But he's do he is doing a good descent at the moment. The Norwegian, meanwhile, is Festeg Barsing, a little bit more experienced, as Jens was saying, has now disappeared and is uh, currently on this particular stretch of road out of sight. But this really is just showing you the majesty of this part of the world. It is absolutely spectacular. There's nothing quite like riding bikes in the mountains. It is perilous, but right now we've got ideal conditions. In fact, it's cool. The temperature warming as the riders lose that elevation and head right back down into the valley again. But this is a long, long descent punctuated by a flatter section about halfway down. And they go through a little village called Le Villare du Nial. And that uh, essentially is around the halfway point. And they have a good three or four Ks on the flat at that particular before, point before dropping down again, kicking up, then hitting the valley. And then they'll start the penultimate climb of the day. The Monte du Villaret, 8.6 Ks at just under 6%. That comes with a crest with 9Ks to go. They'll then descend and then commence the final very steep climb to the line where the Tour de l'Avenir will be decided. That's a climb of 4.9Ks at just under 9% to the finish in saint foy tarentaise And this is a confirmation. It is indeed Pelizzari, who's uh, joined forces with Del Toro. Um, there's also another rider in the mix as well there. So Del Toro is out in front in the white in the polka dot jersey. Pelizzari is the man sitting in position number three. I can't quite identify that. Is that one of the Colombians in the gap or is it the Belgian? Let's have a little look. Yeah, we did see Lacerre was leading that group and it does yeah. sort of look like his posture. So uh, it might be that Lacerre has just done a demon descent down those uh, first couple turns and he's just pulled away from the rest of the group uh, across to the two chases. Um, looks like they've got about 15 seconds on the group of Ricatello. Uh, but these three riders will be committed if that is indeed Lacerre. He's, uh, he's going to pull with these three riders uh, just three riders who are you've got everything to gain they could be the podium at the end of the day if they put enough time into Ricatello so uh, there's no reason at all that they will not work together and then uh, Ricatello he might be lent on behind I don't think Pigonzoli is going to pull behind so uh, he it's probably uh, it's, yeah, it really isn't a good uh, good situation for Ricatello he's completely isolated no teammates around him anymore and uh, three attackers up the road who are threatening his lead in the general classification yeah this is a not good at the moment for the American, but what we have to remind ourselves of and what he will be reminding himself of is, is his superiority on the climbs themselves. Um, but this isn't ideal, especially if they open up 30, 40, 50 seconds. It's then going to be very hard to close, especially if riders start to attack him. The next climb, well, there's this midsection that they could open up a little bit of a gap if Riccitello doesn't have any assistance behind. 40 seconds it is to the chases here. I'm not too sure if that's been taken from the Norwegian, who's now in front of Josh Golica. I'd imagine it is. So Golica looks like he's between five and 10 seconds behind his former breakaway counterpart. And this is group number three on the road. So we've got one rider on his own now. That's Svestad uh, Barsing of Norway. Second on the road is Joshua Golica. Tenacious attacking rider. Attacked multiple times yesterday, but has now gone clear. It's clearly got his climbing legs back, isn't he? To go clear on the Isaran. He's a nowhere on the general classification. Uh, well, no threat, should I say, on the general classification. Um, but he's clearly got good legs today, especially after the way he performed yesterday. He seems to have really found his legs deep into this race. It does look like it, but uh, the, the general classification is where it is at. I don't think the two leaders are going to be able to hold on if these three commit to this move with uh, 50 kilometers still to go. Two uh, shorter but still significant climbs at the end, and especially the final one is pretty steep in parts because uh, that average gradient of just under 9% doesn't say it all. Uh, it's It's got some really steep parts. Uh, it's going to be hard to hold on to one minute for a solo rider uh, fighting against three 
GC leaders fully committed to this move. Um, I, it will be interesting, though, to see if Belizari is going to work with the other two, because with Bigonzoli behind, he might choose to uh, to sit in and, and profit from uh, the other two uh, riders' work. Um, that That's the only question mark I've seen uh, above this move, because otherwise it's, it's a really, really interesting one. No, I, I, I totally agree. Pelizzari is the rider of uh, from yesterday and today. He seems to have the slightly better legs. Piganzoli is third at 1.05. A further one minute and two seconds back is his teammate. But I do think Pelizzari has that card, especially looking for the stage win. He, he can say, unless his teammate is in difficulty, at the moment he's on the back. That's not overly telling um, because we're descending. Not really much benefit, say, from accelerating out the corners the quickest. Um, and descending well, the aerodynamic side of things but in terms of saving energy sitting on the wheel it's not that much different but when we get to these flatter sections here and you can really get on top of the gear i think this is this little plateau that we were talking about there's actually a small kick up in a minute as well 45 seconds it's saying back to the peloton well i don't think there's much of a peloton left at all and we are only working with a couple of cameras you can just see in front now svestad Barseng, just at the top of your screen a tiny minuscule dot at the center of your road only about between five and ten seconds between these two but it does show the differential in the ability to descend but i think we are on that little plateau now where this is where the gaps could open up when these riders start relaying in yeah and it does look like Benitari is pulling through actually and and it, i think it does make sense i think it makes sense for him to pull uh, at this point but yeah we're uh, we're opening up not too many corners anymore. It's still going downhill for the moment, but it will uh, will really flatten out in, a, in maybe three kilometers time. Uh, that's when the real uh, gaps can open up because if Ricciatello, uh, Ricciatello is being lent on behind, then uh, he's going to lose a lot of time to three riders of equal ability, really pulling through, pulling turns. Um, that could be a huge, huge problem for the American. Nope. It certainly could. This is not looking good at all. But the gaps are slender at the moment. We've got no direct indication of where the American is. Although, actually, based on our pictures before, he was only about 10 or 15 seconds off. So let's. Uh, this is Group Three. I think it's fair to say on the road. We've got two riders independently off the front. This is Group uh, Three, being led by Isaac Del Toro, the King of the Mountains, the stage winner on the Col at Dillalos, just ahead of Matthew Ricciatello. He backed it up with a superb performance in the time trial where he finished third. Yesterday he finished second, took another 17 seconds away from Riccitello and now sits at only 54 seconds down. So this is looking good at the moment, but that 45 second gap shows between the peloton and group three, shows that the gap is only 15 seconds right now. So this at the moment is manageable, but what Riccitello will not want is if that starts to go out a lot more. Um, especially on the next climb, that the next climb he ends, the Monte di Villare, is um, tops out with only nine k's to go. It's still a fair distance away, but before that we've mostly got descending, and it's not a super steep climb. It's just under six percent. It's one of those climbs where a group could actually ride and actually get a little bit of rest in the wheels again. It's not one of these super super steep ones where it's every man for themselves. There will be a benefit for a group of committed riders on the next classified climb. Yeah, and also the whole way towards that climb, we've got that flatter section that lasts for about six kilometers. Then we've got even more descending um, down to 26 kilometers to go. That's uh, that's still a terrain where there is a benefit to being in a group. Then there's a very short climb, just a one kilometer kick up to about 7%. And then even more descending, and that then turns into a false flat uphill, which then turns into that next climb, which is also not too steep. It's all terrain really until uh, maybe 11 kilometers to go where uh, a group is a huge benefit if uh, if these riders can work together it's just going to save so much energy and they're probably going to go even quicker as well uh, than a rider on his own uh, and then just those final 11 kilometers it's got some descending and some steep climbing uh, that's where the difference can be made between individual riders uh, but for a group pulling away from uh, from a solo rider it's uh, yeah this is the terrain to do it well Riccatello is there with Archie Ryan Archie Ryan is helping so Archie Ryan is driving hard on the front. Again, Archie Ryan fell away from the general classification. Um, but he's helping out with this group. And again, it's not just about, of course, it is about the GC. Riccatello um, could do with some allies here. He's got no teammates. But because the race is still so delicately balanced in terms of time gaps, these could all change on the next significant climb, as we know. 
a rider, the way Archie Ryan is going, he might be thinking, well, I'm willing to work with this one. I'm not working for Rick, uh, Ricciatello, but I fancy another stage win here. And that's why this group is driving behind. So it's not just about everybody sitting on Ricciatello. If there's a shout of a stage win, other riders who've got nothing from this race yet might actually be willing to help him. Yeah, so if we're just going to go through the situation, Golikar has just made it back to uh, Svejstad, uh, the two riders at the front. Uh, then we've got that trio uh, in the back going for the GC with uh, Pedizari, with Delto and with Vasser. And then the four riders behind with uh, Archie Ryan, Matthew Ricciatello, um, Davide Picanzoli and uh, Pinzon is the Colombian there. Um, most riders going for the GC, but I think Ryan and the two leaders, uh, Svejstad and Golikar, are definitely there to win a stage. And, from their perspective, the front two riders, they have to keep on going. They have to hope the rest comes back together behind and uh, uh, they uh, they have the chance to pull out some of, some of the sort of gap. Uh, and for Archie Ryan, he just has to get back to being with the shadow of the stage win. So it makes sense for him to pull. Uh, I don't think Piganzoli is going to do any work with uh, Pedizai working in this group. And Pinzon, you know, he can work. He could not work. It doesn't really matter too much for him, I think, because because of the place where he is in the GC. He's in seventh. Um, he's not really being threatened by anyone up front. Um, the only way to do it is to save energy and have some more left for the final climbs, and maybe uh, maybe he can pick up a place that way. Yeah, it's uh, yeah, not overly complicated, but there's just a lot going on. Um, different ambitions, different aims, different reasons to ride, different reasons not to ride. That is the beautiful complexity of bike racing, and it's playing out now. It really is. So, it's still pretty tight at the front. We've got our two leaders, Golica and Svestad Barsing, out in front. The Norwegian, super, super stylish on a bike. Uh, considering he's riding at the pro team level, he's still only a very young man. It looks like they're slightly easing here. I don't know why. Maybe they're not. So, it's 30 seconds is a decent lead. But behind, everybody in this group is riding. On the front, it is Lesev. He's got his uh, jersey tucked into his neck there. And there's a conversation being had here. Um, they seem to be riding together. Man just sat on the wheel there. Again, only 19 years of age as Josh Golica rides for the Group Armour FDJO Conti team. He's got with him a 20-year-old for company. So two of the younger riders in this field. But right now they are relaying really well. But the gap is coming down now. 20 seconds to this group. And Pelizari pulling a long turn on the front here. And this man has been so impressive, hasn't he? The Mexican, surely he must be moving up next year. He's just been so impressive over the last three days, hasn't he? Yeah, the, we've seen some rumours going around on the, on the social media platforms. We've seen uh, talks about him joining UAE Team Emirates next year. That's uh, completely unconfirmed, but it's just people basing that off uh, of the bike brand he's riding. He's got uh, the same helmet, so those sorts of things are flying around. Uh, nothing confirmed yet, of course, but um, uh, there's no doubt that there's going to be interest from multiple teams looking at how he's racing this race. Uh, I think he still has some things to learn. He's still super young, of course. Um, coming from what's not a not the most traditional cycling country he's he's got some things to learn like he was descending on the on the hoods just now whereas uh, it really would be better to descend in the drops but he's still going really quickly uh, especially uphill uh, yeah it's it's one of the most exciting talents in cycling right now i think we're uh, we're just being the first people to be introduced to him but uh, i think next year a lot more people are going to be excited by this rider i totally agree i did actually i was looking i started to follow him on instagram and the other day as our two in front seem to be easing there seems to be an agreement here and uh, that they're going to wait for this group behind because they are it, this might actually be the smart thing to do um five is certainly better than three in terms of staying away for the stage win and especially how determined those riders are in front so this affords them a little bit of a break remember they rode pretty much the entirety of the Col de Isérin together so um with this group just behind and the type of riders that's in it um, and the fact that they are closing in on the lead, it might actually be the sensible thing to do. Five is certainly better than the three and the two, and uh, then they can sort it out between them on the final climb. So that does appear to be the case at the front. That's certainly what it looks like right now. Yeah, the two riders up front can just kill their legs by continuing to ride, or they can drop back, maybe do a little bit of work, but mostly just sit in, uh, in the wheels of these three riders who are going to ride regardless because uh, they're going for the GC. Uh, they might as well just sit on the wheels and save some energy for the final because uh, with the current situation they're probably going to get caught by these three riders anyway uh, whether it's now or on the climb it's better to do it now to sit on the wheel in the descent i think that makes well, this, the most sense yeah totally well this is where riders will learn um, very very quickly 
um, by their mistakes or, or, of course, getting it right, because they're not on the radio. It's just reminding people watching. These riders are not linked up to the radios, the team managers at all. It doesn't, under 23 racing doesn't allow that. Um, so they're having to make that call on their own, having to discuss things between themselves. They haven't got that experienced ear um, to lean on as we pass through uh, a few tunnels here. And they're back relaying again, but I certainly think that might be the correct thing to do. Certainly, if I was a DS looking at the situation on the road, I'd be telling uh, uh, Josh Golicker to ease off. Um, keep riding, but what you can do, you can prolong that period of rest by just backing off 10 or, 10 or 20 watts is all you need to actually have an effective recovery for three or four minutes, then get back in the wheels, offer a little bit of um, assistance to the riders just behind. But it is a fascinating one uh, and easy for us to to say because the riders in front don't exactly know what the race situation is all they have to rely on is the is the motorbike to their left hand side at the moment as well yeah i think that's face that especially was just asking one of the motorbikes for an update on the situation but they don't seem to be fully waiting i think they're just indeed as you say backing off and uh, and sort of not continuing to ride full gas just backing off a little bit saving some energy and uh, they know probably that they're going to go get brought back in uh, it's just a matter of when it's gonna happen at this point um, but yeah I think the most interesting thing well I hope they get brought back in so that second camera can drop back to the the group of Ricatello <laughs> just so that exactly. we can see more of the racing <laughs> no you're quite right um, again we're just stressing that uh, this race um, the pictures that you're seeing um, it's done on a, on, a, on a far smaller budget of course than a bigger race we've got no helicopters um, we don't have uh, aeroplanes to bounce the, the, the satellite signal off, so we're relying on 4G. But uh, for the vast majority of the time, we've had some great pictures here, shining a light on these stars of the future in this uh, wonderful race that we are seeing for the very first time. So there is the split screen. There's our two leaders we've become familiar with now, especially Mr. Golica in the white jersey of Great Britain. He's on the front now, just behind him, Svestad Barsing of Norway currently riding at pro tour level as Jens was saying earlier on with a team that sadly might be looking like it's folding at the end of the season a team that's been around for a long time in various guises of course referring to human powered health now by the look of the body language here they definitely are easing up but uh, not fully pressing on and weirdly if you just gently press on and keep the momentum going you can still save energy for a longer period of time as we get passed through a, uh, a rather dramatic looking tunnel and this looks like it might be group number three out three on the road. That's the familiar figure of Ivan Romeo just on the back there by the looks of things. Rides for the World Tour team Movistar, took out stage six, and he's got a teammate with him for company. So this is an interesting little group that's now coming across the gap. Two Spanish riders about to make contact with group two, and this looks like it is the peloton. It is definitely the peloton. And look at the solitary figure. This is a difficult situation for Matthew Riccatello. Two Italians latched onto his back wheel. No assistance from anybody else. Wow, difficult, difficult times. And this is the dangerous section of road where they, the riders in front now can build up that buffer before we head into the final two climbs. Yeah, confusing uh, c confusing images we just got introduced to. But I think what's going on is that we've got Space starting Golica at the front. Then there's three chasers, uh, Del Toro. Pelitari and Lacerre, and these two Spanish riders have just jumped across from that peloton that we just saw yep. uh, where Riccatello is riding. So uh, two, be, well, three become five, uh, basically, the two Spanish riders. And uh, I think this is Asparen with uh, Romeo uh, riding uh, in front of him. There we go. Uh, and I think these Spanish riders, they're not going to sit on. I think uh, at least one of them is going to pull turns with these riders. And that add, just adds some more firepower to that move. Uh, that, that is putting Riccatello under a huge amount of pressure and uh, Riccatello, he's being lent on in this group with a lot of riders in his wheel, but no one's uh, assisting in the chase. Yep, he, he can't do any more than this. He can't just sit on the front and ride and waste energy. Um, they're all swinging across the road and with each second that this happens, each pedal rev, when you're only putting about 150 watts through, they are losing time because look at the momentum in front. 50 seconds it's gone out to. I think it's going to get beyond that now. And there are several teammates of riders up the road in that back group as well who will just continue to watch, to wait. It looks as if we've got at least one British rider, Nurekar, in there. A couple of the Colombians in the mix as well, Pescador. Uh, and also we have, I didn't quite catch the number there. But uh, yeah, the two Spaniards here definitely I think will work. 
and they're not just going to sit on and risk getting caught again. That's a good move. They're no threat on the general classification. Asperin, in fact, is the best placed in 14th place overall, so no threat on the general classification. But the riders that they've joined are certainly a threat. So it's getting pretty dramatic now. Just under 40 k's to go, Jens, and we find the young American leader of this race, um, Matthew Riccatello, in a very precarious situation. Yeah, I mean, it's it's very hard to see how he's going to get out of this situation. I think he may have already lost the GC. Just uh, it's it's very early to call that, of course. But we we're getting another. Um, well, let's just have a look. It's another 20 kilometers of descending, and if yeah. you look at this uh, this kind of road, it's so much easier if there's riders working with you to uh, to get up the pace and. Uh, He's, uh, he's just being lent on to work. Uh, we just saw a couple riders pulling through, but they weren't pulling full gas. Uh, these five riders are going to be working together, and that's so uh, such a huge benefit on these kinds of roads. Um, it's now 30 seconds, so he still has the virtual lead, but um, I can't see him holding on to that, especially if he's the only rider working. He's going to lose even more energy as well as time before those final climbs start. So uh, I don't see how he's going to get out of this without enlisting the help of some other riders uh, who aren't on his team because he doesn't have any teammates left. And what it does show as well is, I know this isn't a World Tour race, these, um, the teams are built very differently than pro teams, of course, but it just shows how important in stage racing. I think this magnifies um, for those racing at a slightly lower level the importance of teammates. You need teammates around you. Why World Tour teams in Grand Tours um, there's so much thought gone into the sorts of riders you need to cover off moves like this, situations like this, should I say, on various different sorts of terrain. You need your rulers, you need your pretty pure climbers, you need riders who can ride on all, on all different terrains and also have the resilience to stay in the mix um, when the racing splits up. But unfortunately for the young American, this isn't a criticism, this is a, just an observation. Um, he hasn't got the firepower in that team and to stay with him on the high, high mountains in the Alps. And, uh, and he's been exposed today. Uh, it doesn't take anything away from his own ability, but it shines a spotlight on you cannot win a race on your own. You do need to have the, uh, the benefit of teammates. Yeah, just to add on, I think I just timed it, and I could be wrong, but I think I just timed the gap between the second group on the road and the Pelzon with the yellow jersey at a minute, which would mean that the virtual yellow jersey has already gone to Del Toro. Um, and that's really not good news for Riccatello. Um, but yeah, as you said, teammates, they're super important, but you can't just draft teammates into a national team, exactly. uh, especially at the under-23 level. There's just a limited pool of riders to, to pull from. Uh, it's not like a commercial team where you can just hire a bunch of climbers to, uh, to ride at the front for you. Uh, and to be honest, El Del Toro doesn't have any teammates in here, as a, here either, and he's just uh, climbed a little bit better on these arms and then descended better. Um, so in the end, uh, you don't fully make your own luck, but there is a part of that where uh, Del Toro was just better on uh, on some of the places in this race, and th that way he was able to exploit the uh, the lack of teammates that Riccatello has. Uh, if if Riccatello was just the best climber in the race, he would have responded to those attacks. He might have just put everyone under pressure and been solo over the top of these around. So he wasn't able to do that, got put under pressure on the descent, and, uh, and now it looks like he, the race is slipping out of his fingers. Yeah, it certainly is at the moment, unless he can, uh, something happens, unless he manages to find one or two allies just to keep momentum going. This is the peloton behind. The riders just shot off the front. And this uh, downhill section, about four or five percent, carrying a lot of speed there. Bank into that corner. And this is the group out in front. Our Mexican friend Isaac uh, Del Toro just dropped off the back of the group there perhaps looking for a little bit of support from a team car. And because the gaps are still so narrow, I don't think the team cars, well, they wouldn't have dropped in just yet. Um, but the distances at these sorts of speed, there's going to be, based on the minute time gap, well in excess of a kilometre between at the front and at the back group now. And that looks indeed as if it is actually Archie Ryan at the back of the group. I thought he was in the front. He's definitely right. That is Archie Ryan on a, on a Cervelo. He was in that group in between, so I'm not too sure what's happened to him there, but um, well, on the descent he was, but he's at the back of this group, calling for a little bit of assistance, or maybe asking the camera to disappear while he answers a call of nature by the looks of things. Yeah, I think that was it, but that group <coughs> is, uh, is a huge group at this point. Uh, Del Toro also 
adjusting something somewhere. I'm, I'm not quite sure what he is doing, but he's, uh, he's sitting in at the moment. It's, uh, he's leaving it up to the other riders to work. Um, but the, the gap's not quite confirmed yet that, that minute, if that was correct or not. But uh, it did certainly look like it, or the pictures were not quite lined up. Um, I think he's just eating, and, uh, and, and that is another thing that you have to keep doing. And I can imagine Richard, uh, Riccatello in the situation that he currently is in, is that's one of those things that you tend to forget because it's, it's such a stressful situation. You're trying to descend quickly. Uh, you're under pressure and then you can yeah, just forget about those kinds of details that, uh, that can make or break a race. Um, not saying that he is doing that, but uh, it, it, those things can play into this, uh, this kind of race. And uh, yeah, still quite a long way to go uh, to the finish line. It's, it's not quite an hour of racing anymore, I think, but uh, it's, it's going to be pretty close to that with those steep climbs coming up. Yeah, I think it is. Both the climbs are relatively short. Well, save for the, the penultimate climb is a bit longer, 8.6 k's at 5.8 percent. And then the final climb, just under 5 k's at 8.7. So that's the steepest one. That's the climb to the line at saint foy d'Arentes. But the situation on the road is that we have the Mayo Jean, the yellow jersey of the Tour de l'Avenir, having taken it on at stage six. Um, when Zac del Toro took the stage on the Col de la Loza, so Riccatello is... Um, Isolated on the road at the moment. Not too sure at what point, because it's out of sight of our cameras, at what point the group containing Del Toro went clear, whether it was just over the top of the Izaran or on the descent itself. And when the dust settles on this stage, no doubt we will find out. But he is isolated and round about a minute behind. And this is the group on the road. It's a dangerous group. Isaac Del Toro is there. Giulio Pelizzari is in the mix. Josh Golica is clear with Svestad Barsing of Norway and they're about to be caught. The surf is also there. We've also got two Spaniards who had nipped across that group recently. Inokoiz Asparin and Ivan Romeo who took the stage the other day to Lac du Agobelet. So that's the situation on the road. 32 k's to go. The next 10 k's are going to go, are going to go very quickly indeed as we look at the Mayo Jean. And before we hit the sharp end of the race, and just going to remind you, is what happened over this week. It's been a wonderful week of racing. I hope you've enjoyed it at home. I know me and Jens um, have enjoyed having your company. The racing has been unpredictable and spectacular. That's what you expect. But the first stage of the race, back in Brittany now, it seems an eternity ago that finishing at La Gessilie was taken by Anders Voldager of Denmark. That moved him into the Mayo Jaune. Riley Pickerel took the bunch sprint for Canada on stage two to Chinon. And Mikhail Pomorski of Poland took the overall lead. The team time troll to Vata was won by Denmark, and Karl Frederick Bevort moved in to the yellow jersey. Fabio Christian of Switzerland took the stage to Evo Le Bar, and Simon Dolby of Denmark moved into the jersey. Certainly a case of, of musical chairs in terms of the Mayo Jean. Ivan Romeo, as we've mentioned, took stage five. Simon Dolby staying in at the Mayo Jean, and then Isaac Del Toro took the Queen stage, the Col de la Loz, ahead of Matthew Riccitello but Riccatello moved into yellow. Uh, the stage to La Calidis was won by Matthew Riccatello. That was the individual time trial that we had yesterday morning. He held on to the jersey, in fact, extended his lead, and it was Archie Ryan who took yesterday's stage B to uh, Valsini, Col du Mont Sini, and Riccatello still in the jersey, and this is the final stage of the race. 99.6 Ks, an explosive race it's been so far, and the race really for Riccatello is on the line here. Still a couple of nasty climbs to come, but we're getting the time gap now that the gap is 50 seconds, and this is really in the balance. What can Riccatello do on the next climb? What do you think he can do, actually? Let's, let's, let's pose that one, Jens. Do you think if he remains calm and just uses the momentum of this descent to take us into the next climb, he's going to have to try and bridge across on his own? What do you think he can do here? Yeah, it's such a difficult situation for him because there's really no good options. Uh, and, and you see it here, it's just the second he backs off the pace, people start attacking him. So um, is there a good option for him? I don't think so. I think he just has to choose like the least worst option, the least bad option uh, that's available to him. And that's just sort of keeping that tempo high, but not so high that he goes over the limit. He should just, well, if you look at the gap there, one minute and 40 seconds, it's... Uh, yeah, that's I think if good. that's if that's actually the case, then it's it's already over for him for uh, for the win in the overall. But he has to still maximise his his um, 
ability to finish high up in the general. So I think it's just pacing and not going too, too hard, not going over his limit, keeping enough to still do those climbs at a good pace, just limiting the amount of time that he loses on this descent by keeping the pace high enough and then uh, yeah, just time trialing his way through the, the last 30 kilometers of the stage. That's, that's how uh, I think all he can do because there's not much else available to him. He can't lean on other riders. I mean, I guess he could offer money to, for someone else to ride, but that's, uh, that's not something that happens very often in the U23 routine given uh, the uh, very limited salary options uh, for these riders. So yeah, I don't, I don't think that's going to happen. Uh, I think he's just going to have to pace himself. That's, it's the only option available to him uh, at the yeah. moment. I, I would agree. Just looking back to the stay, the individual time trial that he won, he won that by a handsome margin, and it's completely different. But what it does highlight is the fact that this lad can climb exceptionally well on his own. Um, he won in 31 minutes, 31 seconds, but 40 seconds into Big Anzoli, 46 seconds into Del Toro, and fourth was Pelizzari, and one and a half minutes nearly into Le Cerf. There the riders in front. He's got that in his armory, but the more this lead goes out, another five seconds have gone, it becomes increasingly difficult to task. And, uh, and I, it is a difficult one. Does he leave it to the top of this next climb, um, which um, we've still got the best part of 17 kilometers to go before we get to the top of the Monte du Valle, and then the final climb to the line. He could easily take a minute back, but he needs to save energy. It is a very difficult situation for the American. He's got to think on his feet. He's also not going to get stressed. It's, it's coping with stress in a situation like this that's one we don't often talk about, is it? There's the physiological demands of having to shut down the moves, but there's the stress now of seeing this race or the chances of success of this race slowly ebb away, isn't there, as well? He needs to try and keep a calm head as best he can. Yeah, and I mean, that's difficult when you've got a, a DS in your ear uh, telling you exactly what to do, but he even doesn't have that. He's, uh, he's going to have to do this all on his own, uh, and that makes it even more difficult. I think, yeah, physiologically, as you say, it, it is possible to just stay under your limit, not go over it uh, at this point of the race, save something for the final climbs, and just do, if he just does his best possible pace up those climbs, uh, there is a possibility that the riders in front might have gone a little bit too deep or they might even start looking at each other thinking they've already got the chance of the GC win uh, up ahead and yeah that's that's maybe his only chance but sometimes you just have to admit that there is no way to win the race if you're not strong enough and uh, and you get dropped and you get caught in a situation like this sometimes it's just not going to happen and uh, there is no option to do it and at that point you just have to think well, how am I going to get second or third? Because um, he could still hold off Belizari, for instance. Belizari is uh, at exactly two minutes and seven seconds. I mean, if this group stays at the same sort of gap, then uh, that's definitely still possible. And uh, then he'd still finish second in the in the overall. Um, so that's, you know, you might lose the win that way, but the second place in the Tour de l'Avenir year is not, not too bad either. Um, it, it might not be the ideal scenario, but again, how is he even going to win this? He, he has to take back, uh, well, 50 seconds at the moment. Uh, and, and Del Toro is riding with these other riders, able to sit in sometimes for uh, for a couple seconds. Ricatello is just having to uh, to do most of the work on his own. Although, I mean, there aren't riders working for him. There's just riders attacking here. But that means he does get a, a draft some some of the time. But uh, yeah, we're getting we're getting pretty close to the climb starting again. Of course, this is that small one kilometer climb uh, that that just sort of um, breaks up the descent. Um, this is this is one point where he's uh, he's going to be a little bit more comfortable. Yeah, it's um, just looking now at the uh, rider who's taken the front. So it looks like it's one of the teammates to the front of the group behind. It looks like it might be um, a teammate of Archie Ryan who started to take things up. Not too short. Sure. But uh, this is the combination of the group out in front now. Uh, William Junior Le Cerf is there of Belgium. We've got Josh Golica, one of the early protagonists, who's out in front as well. Giulio Pelizzari of Italy. He's in the white jersey, the tall, rangy rider there. As we see, the French now taking things up. Now, this is interesting. The French are not represented in front in, at, at all. We've got Matisse Rondel. He could be losing his fifth place overall potentially here as well. He sits in fifth at two minutes and ten seconds. And the French yesterday as well didn't have a great day. Hondel couldn't or didn't manage to get any of those moves. And this is bad news as well. 
a real underscoring of the fact that this lead is going out because all the team cars now are going ahead to the group in front. We've got uh, Emblet Svestad Barsing also in the move as well from Norway. Isaka del Toro is there too. So that is the combination of the riders out in front. It is a potent mix. And for the first time now, on his favoured terrain, our yellow jersey, our brave yellow jersey, He's got his back against the wall here. He is really on the metaphorical ropes, but I tell you what, he is not giving up. He talked about the fact his options are limited, but um, where he can fly and where he can make a bit of uh, difference is on the climbs, and that's exactly what young Matthew Riccitello was doing now. Yeah, he's, uh, he's clearly staying calm enough to know what he's doing. He's, uh, he's having to ride, uh, but he's, he's actually fulfilling that, that obligation. Um, he could also be annoyed at all the riders sitting in his wheel, uh, starting with uh, Pigonzoli on second place. Uh, but he's not doing that. He's, uh, he's just decided to put his head down and ride. And uh, that's really the only thing he can do at this point. Yep, it definitely is. He's got to focus. He will be frustrated. He, he will be angry. Um, but you can easily lose your head. But what he's doing now, I think he's doing the right thing. His options are clearly limited. But what he can't do is sit back and ask anybody else to ride because we've seen that group. The only, motor, the only movement from that group is the momentum created by attacks. Um, it looks like we've got one rider that's just clipped off here. Unless that, no, that was the last rider, sorry, in the group counting. As we get a reminder of the situation at the top of the general classification. Right now, Riccatello leads, but the virtual leader is actually Isaac Del Toro, based on the time gaps that we have. But Riccatello now who rides for the Israel Premier Tech Pro Team is on the front and accelerating clear and they're looking like they're having a little bit of a hard time holding his wheel here he's putting him under a lot of pressure now is that i thought it was an american teammate it certainly wasn't it was just an italian with his jersey unzipped which matched almost the american national jersey so 23.6 k's to go and riccitello is having to take things into his own hands here yeah but he's stepping up to the mark and i think Given the fact that this is number 23 race, it is not a professional race. This is, uh, well, you could say it's all about learning. Uh, it's not about yeah. performing at this stage of his career. And, uh, and this is just a valuable lesson in, in tactics, in, uh, in how racing works. Sometimes it's, uh, it's not too nice if, uh, if all the riders are sitting on your wheel, you're in the yellow jersey, you're uh, about to lose the GC in a, in a big race. But you know that's it's, it's part of, uh, of part of cycling is dealing with that kind of situation. And uh, at the moment, I think he's doing the only thing that he can do, which is ride. Yep, I think he is doing the right job. At least he can hold the gap and try something on the final steeper climb. As you can see, the riders on his wheel will have that benefit, and they'll certainly be hurting because he's setting a ferocious pace. This was a little uncategorized climb. We're now dropping down, finally, into the valley before we'll commence the next climb of the day and on the menu penultimately for climbing in this year's Tour de l'Avenir is the Monte du Villare 8.6 k's at 5.8 percent that crests with nine k's to go so we've got about three or four k's until we hit the bottom of the penultimate climb of the day get steeper towards the top so uh, the section beforehand is just a long drag and the gap now holding steady at 1 minute 45 seconds Josh Golica lad from Great Britain sat at the back of this group it's quite a narrow sketchy descent this one isn't it yeah and we see that the road is wet in some places uh, it's dry in other places but that just makes it even more dangerous because that means that you sometimes go into a corner thinking it's dry and then it turns out that the surface is wet so this is a is a really risky descent uh, narrow road sometimes wet sometimes dry that's uh, that's one of those most dangerous places to ride I don't think any of the riders really need to take any huge risks. Um, just losing five seconds is not the end of the world for anyone at this point. Um, but it is a risky descent looking at the sides of the roads as well. It's, uh, it's not fun to go down here. No, this is uh, a little back lane here. I'm uh, slightly on the edge of my seat here. That was a real close one there. I tell you what, Riccatello is pushing here. Now that was very close. He's absolutely fine, but that was uh, that road just whipped round very quickly. Then he had to flick his bike inside. I think that's taken the wind out of his sails a little bit. That little move there, we've all experienced that before, haven't we? Uh, now it's the French that have taken uh, it up at the front. Still, the gap is holding at around 1 minute 45 seconds. But I think the time checks we're getting are from static points on the road because they do not fluctuate at all. Um, so I think. 
what we're looking at is an old time gap but given the terrain that we're on i don't think it's moved too much from the previous one but uh, just under two minutes as we continue to plummet down this descent got another couple of kilometers of uh, almost looks like a service road heading down into the valley into a mont of and then it's uphill down and then we have the final climb to saint foy tarantes who is going to take the win today but importantly who is going to take the overall classification of the tour de l'avenir it's falling away from young matthew ricatello at the moment but boy is he fighting pushing on the descent pushing on the climbs but he's got a little bit of an alloy now here uh, as france are continuing to maintain the pace from the chase group Jens. yeah i think just after that crash it uh, or near crash and it wasn't a crash but it, it he almost hit the wall there and uh, it, yeah. it did look like he he almost cramped up in his uh, in his thighs there to stop pedaling after getting out of the saddle so i think that might have been uh, been going on with ricatello which is also not a great sign with those climbs coming up but uh, that kind of jerky movement of uh, trying to correct uh, a near crash there that that can bring on uh, and cramps if you're already close to them this oh, looks definitely. like it might now be uh, Matisse Rondel himself pacing uh, the fourth place, no, fifth place rider, I think, uh, on GC at the moment. Two minutes and ten back. He's, uh, his GC is also under threat with Lacerre uh, moving up uh, into this group. He's, uh, they're almost equal virtually now on the road uh, in the general classification. So uh, he also, I think, without teammates in that group, having to push himself. Yep. It is a fascinating situation. We've got seven riders out in front. Josh Golica at the back. We've got two Spaniards in the Coisas Pardon and Ivan Romeo. Isaac Del Toro is there of Mexico in the King of the Mountains jersey. Julio Pelizari has had a great couple of days. He sits in fourth at 207. He's in the mix, as is Junior William Lesseur, the best of the Belgians, sitting at her sixth place overall at three minutes and 44 seconds. But it is indeed Matthias Rondel trying to save that fifth place overall i tell you what he's pushing hard here um pushing into every single corner and um it's something that i don't think i've ever talked about um is is when you get something wrong on a descent or or even on your bike you, 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 your whole body tenses up violently doesn't it and it can take a few moments to actually recover from that and it from, from looking at that the way that uh, Riccatello had to adjust it did appear that that's what's happened and also caused him a little bit of shock just a reminder of what oof, you take a breath you compose and those moments of hesitations mean that other riders have uh, have taken things up and he's now lost the wheel a little bit but meanwhile out in front completely different situation far less stress but to del toro now the virtual leader of the tour de l'avenir how does he pick his way out of this one he's certainly got good climbing legs um, I would suggest that he could outride the rest of the riders in that group, but right now he needs to remain patient. The gap is coming down, though. One minute, 30 seconds. Yeah, but this is Matisse Rondel, who's just ridden almost everyone off his wheel on the descent there. It looks like it's uh, Alessandro Pinarello who's with him, who's somehow continuing to ride, even though uh, his, his team leader, Pigonzoli, is just behind, and his other team leader, Peritari, is in front of him, uh, yeah. which uh, I don't quite understand that one, but... Maybe he hasn't fully thought it through. I think he was hesitating there as well. This is the rest of the group coming back to those two. And Riccatello again on a gap. Uh, there are about 10 riders who've just jumped ahead of him. And uh, he's having to do all the work himself once again. Yep, this is it. He's missing some of these little splits. Evidence there. OK, easy for, to say, but there are. there's clearly evidence here from, on several occasions now that he's missing these little splits. And that happened on the descent. They're easing up. There's no momentum in the front. There's no real reason for the Italians to ride. They've got Pelizzari, who's moving up into a podium spot, possibly even better, possibly even a stage win, the way that he rode yesterday. But now there's an attack, and that was Lars Kraps who's has accelerated, and he is going to be a difficult wheel to bring back. He's just jumping across to the group in front that also contains Alex Sigart from Belgium as well. So they are putting Riccatello under a lot of pressure on this valley road. Yeah, and what it looks like now is Piganzoli is also riding as well as Pinarello. They're working together just to keep Riccatello behind that group, even trying to drop him off uh, off the wheel of half the peloton there. Uh, I don't think it's quite worked out, but they're just um, killing him off completely, I think. They're just trying to finish him off there. It, it hasn't yeah. quite worked out, but Riccatello is definitely not in a good spot at the moment. I think... Uh, 
Well, the gap is coming down a bit now with one minute and 30 seconds, but that's uh, even that is not going to be enough for him to hold on to the GC lead. I think second place is about the best he can do at this stage, uh, and even that's going to be difficult. I'm not going to write him off just yet. It's not looking good. He's got Michael Leonard on the front now, the Canadian who rides for the Ineos Grenadiers. The first time we've seen Michael Leonard, he's been relatively quiet, but that was only a short pull on the front. It almost looks like he's pulling on the brakes there. Uh, this staccato style stop start is not going to help uh, Matthew Riccatello at all. All he's going to do is come under attacks and here there's some more come from Norway. They are represented out in front, but Norway have now attacked because they've got yeah. Johannes Kulset up, well, in this group as well. Perhaps Kulset's thinking uh, we want to do something, but with a rider up the road, I'm not too sure what they're doing here. Quite interesting. Archie Ryan also in the mix there in the green. Yeah, well, this is, I think, Kulset who attacked with Dalby and Pigonzoli, so all of the, almost all the riders in the top ten that are not represented in that front group are uh, starting to attack Riccatello as well. Um, he's, he's responding to the attacks quite well at the moment, but this is not the most efficient way to ride this uh, this race. It's just those stop-start attacks take everything out of your legs, and uh, it's going to make those next two climbs even more difficult. Uh, we've got that first climb is uh, is not too steep. Just the final two kilometers kick up pretty significantly. That final climb is uh, is just over eight percent average, but then. The steepest portions are really, really steep. There's some flatter sections in there as well, but there's also some sections up to 15%. And uh, it's, it's not going to be great for that sort of climb to, uh, to be attacking constantly now. But it does look like Del Toro is also under pressure in the front group. Yeah, Del Toro has been attacked here as well. On this uh, long drag that takes us into the climb of the Monte du Valle. It tops out with 9Ks to go. Uh, Junior William Le Cerf there at the back from Belgium. Josh Gollicker on the offensive again with the man that he went away with, Emblet Vestad Barseng, also in the mix. It looks as if it's Asparin of Spain. So, the man who uh, has the most to gain from the general classification perspective has been distanced and has been forced to close the gap. This is a chaotic but riveting finale as we just see the Belgian Le Cerf drop back to give his cape in. And it looks like he's just, has he pulled it back all together? We keep flicking from the front to the rear of the race, but certainly a chaotic, exciting finale now. 16.6 Ks to go. The gap's come down a bit more, 125 now. Yeah, I think they'll always pulled it back, but I don't think he was actually under pressure that much. Uh, it was just the riders that were going for the stage win and, uh, and Lacerre, who's uh, almost three minutes behind Del Toro himself, who, uh, who just tipped off the front there. So he wasn't under any real pressure, just trying to keep the pace high to uh, to maintain that gap over the group, because it is coming down slowly with uh, just five seconds uh, Nips off the gap again, at 125 now. It's uh, it's getting into the territory where it, it does become interesting again. Uh, there's uh, 30 seconds between Del Toro and Riccatello now on the uh, virtual general classification. Um, of course, the gap at the start of the day, 55 seconds. Well, this is if this keeps going like this, Archie Ryan happy to all this attacking. Of course, increases the pace. It then drops off. And there's a couple more riders just latch on to the back of the let's call it the main bunch. And here's another move. It's like Ireland are now picking things up. And um, we heard Archie Ryan commenting on how well his teammates were riding for him. He uh, name-checked Jamie and Meehan and uh, Kevin McCambridge. Um, and there's one of them on the front at the moment anyway. Um, and this again might play into the hands of Matthew Riccitelli. If they can get over the top of this climb with the gap at around a minute, a minute and a half, we then they've got the descent and the final 4.9 Ks could see the pendulum swim back in the favor of Riccitelli because he still has that buffer of 54 seconds over Isaac Del Toro. And that's what he's going to be thinking about now. The gaps come down even further. Yeah, usually you would say that the way the peloton is riding is not the most efficient with all those stop-start attacks, but it doesn't seem they're stopping, they're just attacking over the top of each other, and that way the pace is being uh, kept high. Now it's Riccatello back on the front, uh, but it does look like in the front group it's only two riders working, just Del Toro and Belizari are uh, still riding at the front, all the other riders sitting on their wheel. Although now Space Thought has taken over again, so that point is uh, it's off the table now. Um, but, but the pace is maybe just not quite high enough in that front group to, to keep the gap to the peloton. Of course, it's only two riders that are really going to benefit from uh, the gap being as big as it is. It, it doesn't really matter for most of them. They just want to win the stage there. Well, this is hanging in the balance at the moment. Still, we've got to crest two climbs. The final one is the finish line. 
and we've got the best part of six and a half k's now to the top of the Monte di Villare and the man in the yellow jersey Matthew Riccitello has taken things up has taken things into his own hands this is the terrain that we know that suits him it's not a super steep climb it's a fast climb but the gap is coming down it's saying one minute and ten seconds so the virtual leader is still the Mexican as Riccitello continues in that style that we're coming very accustomed to out of the saddle pressing on as hard as he can well as hard as he can sustain it's not as hard as he can here he needs to make sure this is a tempo that he can sustain and also hold something back of course Jens for the final climb which is uh, even harder than this one yeah the way for him to look at it right now is just a uh, mountain trial of uh, 15 kilometers remaining uh, that's that's all he has to do is just ride as fast as possible up those climbs and see where he's at at the finish um, it would be nice to drop these riders off his wheel, but that's not really going to benefit him too much at the moment. He's uh, The only way to do it is just to ride as fast as possible to the finish line. And In fact, he didn't do too badly. He did not really get some help uh, in, in that descent, but he did get a few riders attacking. He just latched onto those uh, in the right way. And, and in fact, he did probably did do a better job than, uh, than I was expecting because only a minute and a half lost, and he's gained some of that back already on the climb. Yeah, this is a uh, fascinating stuff. Still six k's of climbing, and then we've got four k's of descending and five k's more of climbing. So uh, Riccatello doing a very good job of trying to hold his race together. The man at the back of this group from Mexico um, is in the lead by 16 seconds. That's all it is, and that's on the virtual general classification. But Riccatello now. Um, all he's got to do on this climb now is almost forget about the riders behind him. It's very easy to, to get frustrated with towing riders behind, but this is his only chance of winning this one. Um, he's then got the descent over the top of this climb to recover, and I say that relatively, and to recover a little bit and then go all in on the 8.7% average slopes of the final climb to the line, which, as you were describing earlier, Ron Jens, has far steeper sections in it, which will suit him down to the ground. So he's got, just got to hold a little bit back He's managed to shave off another 10 seconds here. So right now, this is exceptionally bold and strong riding by Riccitello to, to maintain a grasp on the Maillot Jean. Yeah, it's, it's much better than I was expecting when I saw him on the front of a big group, not really pulling through uh, with, with still about 35 kilometers to go. Uh, it's impressive the way he's ridden this so far. He's used the rest of that group to, uh, to his advantage, those attacks responding in the right manner uh, and now he's on the front just drilling it trying to maintain the, the gap at the moment and claw it back slowly uh, and he's, he's doing a really really good job I think it, it is slowly starting to swing back in his favor but uh, it, it's still not over I think some of these riders in the front still have something uh, something extra left it's just the question if that is Del Toro or if there's uh, or if Del Toro is suffering as well yep still um, uh, out of the jersey by six seconds, but it's closing that gap nicely. Got an interesting style on a bike as Riccitello back inside the saddle now, or on the saddle, should I say. And then he spells these long periods of time out of the saddle on a slightly bigger gear. Really aggressive riding and reminiscent of the way that Alberto Contador used to ride, almost exclusively out of the saddle. But as you can see, the gradient's lessened a slight, a bit more of a benefit to sit down, keep that turning. Again, um, quite energy intensive when you're out of the saddle all the time that's why riders generally will use that just to add a bit more pace or of course to attack but then when you when, when you want to settle into a rhythm you will sit down but here he is again out of the saddle just shows you how much force he's needing to put in 105 so it's gone out again but he's still doing a reasonable job here of uh, maintaining a lid on the threat posed by Isaac del Toro a year younger 19 years of age is the Mexican being the breakthrough rider. Well, this is a race of breakthroughs, of course, but one of the big breakthrough riders. And we will be seeing big things from him in the next few years. That is for certain. But right now, the Tour de Lavener, Jens, is, uh, is finally in the balance. It's all going to come down, I think, to the final climb to the line. Yeah, that is what it looks like. There's, uh, there's still about two kilometers of this climb to go, and then we, then it kicks up to uh, to eight, nine percent for the final two kilometers of the climb. So uh, we, we maintain this sort of gradient for a couple of kilometers, and then uh, with 11 kilometers to go, it kicks up 
final uh, couple steep portions, then a five kilometre descent, and the final five kilometres of climbing uh, towards the finish. And that climb is going to be the most interesting one. It's uh, it's a really narrow road for most of the way. Um, steep parts, slightly, uh, even a very slight descent in the middle somewhere um, for for just 100 metres or so. It's uh, it's a slightly weird climb. We don't see those the sorts of climbs too many uh, times in, in the big races, but Tour Lavenir is able to go to these places, and uh, it, it is, uh, yeah, I think it's the ideal final to this race because, uh, yeah, the, the real good climbers are going to shine on that kind of climb. Yeah, that's for sure. And that's what he's got to keep reminding himself. It's the gap is now 105. And you can tell the pace is high because one or two of the riders at the back here are starting to struggle. This is Ivan Romeo. Um, one of another two riders, well, three riders in this break have already won stages. For two, should I say, just the man at the back just latching onto his wheel. The Isaac del Toro has also won a stage two. The man in the yellow jersey took the individual time trial yesterday morning, stage 7A. It's keeping, keeping themselves fueled and hydrated. Ask from assistance. Normally here, if you'd had a teammate, you could have got that from uh, a coéquipier. It's going to have to drop back. Um, that's the thing here, he will have to drop back and um, straight over the top goes one of the Italians. I think this is uh, either um, Ping Piganzoli or Pinarello who's still going straight over the top of him. Yeah, it's, uh, it is Piganzoli on that white bike for uh, the Eolo Cometa team. That's what he rides for in, uh, in his daily life. Uh, he has gone over the top of him. The issue for Riccatello is actually that he cannot drop to the back because the pace will go out. People will start yeah. attacking him. You won't even get to the back of that group to, to get a bottle. And, and I hope for him that the uh, the commissaires in the car behind recognize that that is the race situation and they allow the car of the uh, the American Federation to come up beside him because uh, otherwise he is not going to yeah. get any water. I don't think you will. Even from a breakaway, you have to take your... His car's just come up, but it can't draw alongside the bunch. It's, it's just this is a situation that's very rare he's going to have to drop back as he's doing now but as, this is the race is on now this is one of the cruel things about bike racing he's got no teammates to get a bottle from another group has just gone straight over the top it looks like the rod is exploiting this challenging situation for the american jan christian of switzerland the best place of the swiss sitting in ninth place at four minutes and 43 seconds they've already taken a win with fabio christian but they're looking for another one and that group but look at look how quick the groups disappear up the road once the pace eases awful situation here uh, for Matthew Riccatello yeah and he's just not getting to the back this is a group with uh, young kiss and as you said uh, with Alessandro Pinarello and uh, yesterday's winner Archie Ryan the three of them moving off the front once the pace drops and uh, it looked also as though uh, Pigonzoli just attacked from the group uh, Riccatello is having to respond again and uh, there's no way for him to get that bottle that he uh, really needs yeah, this is a difficult situation. He's got to try and judge this one. We've got 11.9 k's to go. Uh, that's 2.9 k's to the top of the climb. But as you can see, it flattens ever so slightly. It gets steeper at the top. He's just got to bide his time. Again, very easy for me to say not panic. He needs to remain calm. And as soon as the situation arises, drop to the back of that group. Because another little satellite move has gone clear. As we see a warning sign for squirrels on the right-hand side. That was quite interesting back there's the usa team car um it, it cannot put it can pull alongside the rear of a breakaway but what it can't do is pull alongside the bunch here so riccatello there's no real right time to do it because every time he drops back he's going to be attacked here he is dropping to the back of this group and as he does that the frenchman attacks awful situation here but this is real life racing this is absolutely brutal it shows you how hard racing is a double bead on take there for riccatello and, and half of the group that he's with have now disappeared up the road, exploiting the awful situation that Riccatello finds himself in. But with 11.4 k to go, five of that are climbed to the line. He needs to make sure he's got the fuel on board here. Yeah, he does, especially if he's out of order. That's not a situation to be in, but it, it, does, it has allowed Pigonzoli and Rondel, uh, the closest riders who were still in the pedals on, uh, on the GC, they have also disappeared up the road now, so Riccatello is, uh, well, he was already on his own, but now he's also having to chase down those riders. Uh, just a couple of riders getting dropped from the breakaway there. Romeo and, uh, and Golicker seem to have lost the wheel there. Uh, this is that steeper section of the climb, and uh, it is already costing some riders their place in the front group. That certainly is. You can tell on the profile, it, uh, the gradient sharpens dramatically. The road a little bit more fatiginous, but uh, now it is Jan Christian on the front. 
And this is the remnants of the peloton. You saw how big it was just a few moments ago. And as soon as Riccitello put his hand up to drop back, the attacks came. I mean, absolutely brutal. It really is. <sighs> so this is the situation. Riccitello now finds himself in the wrong split. He'd done a good job in mitigating the time loss. But as the road steepens, all he needs to do is try and peg this group. But the pressure being piled on at the front by the man with most to gain, Isaac Del Toro of Mexico. He knows what he needs to do. He knows the class of Ricky Tello as well. And he knows that given the fact he's got most to gain, he could possibly win this race overall. Remember, there are no time bonuses on offer. It's all about the time on the road. He needs to invest a bit on this climb, doesn't he? Yeah, and I wonder what that time gap is uh, is doing right now. Because if it's 50 seconds to Ricatello, that's uh, that's it's definitely swinging back in his favour. But uh, whether uh, that would mean that the riders uh, who are now up the road between the two groups uh, are getting really close, so I'm not quite sure uh, what no. that time gap is referring to. It's uh, it's a little bit confusing for us as well. Uh, but what we do know is it's it's hanging in the balance uh, between Del Toro and uh, and the current leader Ricatello. Yeah, but we're, also, we're also seeing who uh, one of the other strongest men of the race is. He's proved that already. He's in second place overall. He won on the Col de la Lowe's, and it is Isaac Del Toro. He's ripping this breakaway to pieces with the pressure that he's piling in on the front. Meanwhile, there's another very dangerous counter-attack going clear with Jan Christian and at yesterday's stage winner Archie Ryan of Ireland. Now, they've stripped out the team cars here. That means from the front to the back, it is less than a minute. So... And there's a big attack on the left-hand side. It is a Pelizari who now goes on the left. And there's no response at all. Well, there is. It's a late one. And this time, the man that cannot respond is Junior William Le Cerf. He is left now with Svestad Barsing of Norway. And we have two riders going clear. I tell you what, Jens, this is scintillating bike racing. It really is. Yeah, it's the two best-placed riders of the general classification who are in this breakaway who are going up the road. Uh, Del Toro just chasing down Pelizari is in fourth place. Uh, Pelizari is just over a minute behind Del Toro, so uh, Del Toro has to keep an eye on that, but a minute is still uh, still doable, I think. Um, he, he just They just have to work together to get as high up there on the general classification as possible. I think Italy is going to have a hard time to win this race, but they could land two riders on the podium if they uh, if they play it right, and Riccatello is really suffering as much as it seems like he is. And this yeah. is the two chases on the road. They're picking up the remnants of that breakaway. Kirsten and, uh, and Ryan there. Yeah, I think, I mean, looking at the gap behind that they've opened up, that that little group, the Christian and Ryan, they're coming across the gap. I think they are the riders at 50 seconds because behind them was completely and utterly empty road. Um, Golica has now been caught. Um, Le Cerf has now dragged himself back into contention with Svestad Bar saying it's good riding by him. And meanwhile, we head back down the road and to our second camera. We've only got two cameras to cover this race off, so please bear with us as we try and keep you as up-to-date as we can. But this is Riccatello. But there are a lot of riders in between Riccatello and the front of the race now. Um, but this is the front of the race. Four riders strong. Barseng at the back. He was the initial protagonist. Went clear with Golica on the, the mighty slopes of the Col de Israel. Also with him as well, sitting in sixth place overall at 3.44, Junior William Le Cerf. Um, we've got Pelizzari there of Italy. And the man in second place in the mountain jersey, Isaac Del Toro. But meanwhile, Archie Ryan and the man in front of him, Ian Christian, are absolutely romping and mopping up these riders very quickly. Yeah, they're moving quickly. They have sat in, of course, for the majority of that descent, so they have saved some uh, some energy as opposed to what Riccatello uh, and uh, especially the riders in the breakaway have been doing. Um, so they, they might be in with a, a shot of, uh, of getting across that gap and going for the stage win, those two. But the gap's still big enough that they're not going to get back on on this climb. We're, uh, we're less than a kilometre from the top of the climb, and then it's just a fast descent into the bottom of the, the final summit of this race. Well, this has been a magnificent race. From start to finish, it really has. It has got us on tender hooks. We are on the edge of our seat. A thrilling, thrilling race. Matthew R R R Riccatello, the race leader, came into today's stage with a 54 second advantage of Isaac Del Toro of Mexico. And the Mexican right now is up the road, went clear just over the top of the Calder is Isaran, eked out just a slender lead on the descent, and was joined by several riders. And in the valley roads, they've extended that lead, maxed out 
uh, the best part of a minute and 45 seconds. It's now bouncing between a minute and a minute and a half. As you can see, they've stripped out the time gaps because there are so many different groups on this, this climb. We're heading towards the top now. 500 meters will crest the top of the penultimate climb of this year's Tour de l'Avenir, the Monte di Villaret. We ne then have a five kilometer plummet down and then the final climb to saint foy tarentes and that's a horrible climb, 4.9 Ks at 8.7%, but multiple double-digit gradients as well. Uh, Archie Ryan now. Uh, meanwhile, there's another attack. It looks like this is a Kulset now on the offensive. Is it, is it no, it's not. It's Hagnes. <laughs> Sorry. The Norwegians are having a good day. Yeah, I think that's actually Simon Dolby, the Danish rider with uh, number 61. Um, Apologies, but we'll, we'll have to confirm that for you. It's, uh, I think I timed it at 44 seconds to that group with Kisten and uh, uh, and Archie Ryan. So that that's confirmed there, 40 seconds, and I think that means that the peloton uh, at 1:45 that's Ricciello. So uh, yeah. it's a little bit further back than we thought he was, as uh, as Face now loses contact with the front group so much going on here difficult to wrap your head around but uh Isaac del Toro has the bit between his teeth he's not thinking about the stage win now he is thinking about what well, he's probably just secured the mountains jersey cresting that climb another 10 points in the bag so he'll have won that one that is for sure and just behind him all over his bike is a uh, Julio Pelizzari struggling to stay on the wheel of the Mexican who's eating up this tarmac the man on the screen at the moment um, is the man that's just been dropped from the group Embret Svestad Barseng, um, but his teammate has just attacked. Well, one of his teammates is coming across the gap. I think you were right, it was Simon Dolby who's attacked from the bunch behind. This is the remnant of the breakaway, and you can just see Archie Ryan coming across the gap as well with the Swiss rider Jan Christian. So a lot is happening, but importantly, Riccatello now sits at around 1 minute and 45 seconds behind the group with the Mexican, but he does have 54 second advantage. Um, so right now, he is losing the jersey by the best part of 50 seconds as Christian now accelerates on the right-hand side. Yeah, he does, but they're uh, losing time to the front group. 56 seconds at the top of the climb there for Kristen and, uh, and Ryan. They're going to have to do an incredible descent. We know that Kristen can descend fairly well. He's, uh, he's one of those riders who's uh, taking the multidiscipline approach, uh, finishing on the podium of the Mountain Bike World Championships as a junior and uh, also winning the Cyclocross Championships uh, last year. Uh, but 54 seconds in just a five, uh, five kilometer descent, that's not going to happen for him, I don't think. Uh, but we're just waiting to see that timing. This is Pinson uh, with Riccatello, but they're uh, already a minute and a half has passed by since the yep. leaders have topped that climb. So uh, I think at this point, it's going to take a miracle for Riccatello to regain the lead of this race. Also, I think Riccatello, well, there's no doubt about it. Look at his face here. He's uh, suffering all sorts of pain here but he's got a bit of an ally there in the Colombian Pinzon is continuing to drag him over the climb but the, the time gap that you're seeing there is an old one and uh, they're taking that from a static point meanwhile Archie Ryan and the man that's with him Jan Christian are flying down this descent they've got a good chance of at least latching onto the group behind and that there they go they just crest um, the finish line don't know if you've got your your clock on that but again it is around 1 minute and 50 seconds yeah, two minutes in fact already in uh, oh, the minutes. front group with these three riders is descending fairly well. We saw them uh, grow that gap on the descent of the Col d'Isaran. Le Serre especially descending really well. Pelizari and Del Toro following him. Uh, Del Toro also taking a gel there and that's one of those really important things. We saw Riccatello really caring about the fueling. Uh, Del Toro obviously also uh, having that on his mind, uh, taking that final gel to uh, have the necessary carbohydrates to get up that final climb in uh, in one piece. I tell you what, though, I am noticing that, and it makes me feel a little bit nervous. Um, is the fact he is continuing to descend on the hoods, maybe from his mountain bike in the slightly more upright position, feels that control. Um, but one of the reasons that um, we talk about that, it, it's it's not we're picking holes at all. It, it's just it just offers you that little bit. You distribute distribute your weight differently when you're on the drops, and also if you hit a pothole or a divot in the road when you're on the hoods, there's a risk, depending on the handlebar setting you've got, of rotating the bars around as well. So there's multiple different reasons why, generally speaking, descending on the hoods isn't something that's always done. Again, not taking anything away from Del Toro. He's an exceptionally accomplished rider, even at 19 years of age. It's just an observation that you picked up on first. 
Uh, he's dropped onto the, the bottom of the bars now, which uh, makes me feel a bit more reassured as they continue to rock it down into the valley before commencing the final climb of the day. And look at this man here as well. Riccatello is not giving up. He's pushing, 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 and goes round our camera motorbike. Well, this is thrilling stuff here. Yeah, I just hope that he's not taking too many risks, maybe being a bit under fuel there. We uh, we did see him having some difficulties picking up the, the fueling. Um, I, I hope that he, he doesn't go over the limit trying to save that GC, uh, which is already slipping out of his hands. Uh, it's a stressful situation for the young American. It certainly is. The time gap's locked there at 1.45 and 40. These are from static points on the road. That's becoming quite clear to us, but um, um, by our count back, it's around a two-minute lead now from Riccatello to the front of the race where Isaac del Toro is pursuing, well, he's pushing, pursuing the ultimate prize, and that is the Mayo Jaune in the Tour de l'Avenir. They're on to the final climb now, 4.8 kilometers to go, and we have an attack. It looks like it's uh, Le Cerf who is now attacked and clipped up the road. The Belgian, I'm um, not too sure we didn't see him go, but he's been forcing Pelizari to chase but the man with the most to gain here for the GC is Isaac Del Toro. He needs to pace himself up this climb. And this one, as we described, Jens, is a steep one. Yeah, and it's a very irregular climb as well. But we did see Lacerre. He jumped across that gap after the top of the Zanon. He was uh, 10 seconds behind these two and then jumped across the gap in only a matter of kilometers. I think he's just the better descender of these three. Um, just going downhill a little bit quicker, a little bit more comfortable, maybe a little bit more experience as well. As well. You never know uh, what kind of training camps he's already done, uh, but that's, that's, uh, it's, it's good to know. We're just getting, uh, getting to know these riders, of course. Um, we don't really know all their characteristics yet. It seems like Lasser is a, an incredibly good descender, uh, but he's just got a couple seconds uh, at the moment across these two uh, riders. But yeah, he uh, he is looking fairly good for the stage win. It uh, it just depends on who's got the better legs, who's got something left, uh, something extra left on this final climb. And you see how hard it is with the irregular percentages. The asphalt isn't great. It's a narrow road. It's uh, yeah, it's a great final for this Tour de l'Avenir. It certainly is. It's been an absolutely thrilling race, and we've got four and a half kilometers to go. Here is the face of the man out in front. It is William Junior Le Cerf, right from the Sudal Quickstep development team. He's only 20 years of age. He's been consistent in this race so far. He's had a fifth on stage six, seventh, a fifth on stage seven, fourth yesterday, and meanwhile, um, still on the descent behind. We saw our yellow jersey, Matteo Riccatello, remonstrating, understandably, there with the motorbike. He's descending that quickly, the moto can't keep away from him, but that's the chase group in between. It does appear to me, though, that the gap of the Belgian out in front is starting to uh, just come down a little bit. He's settling into the rhythm, but the men behind aren't panicking at all. Isaac Del Toro still sat last man just on the wheel of Giulio Pelizzari, and they appear to be pegging him here. Yeah, I think maybe Del Toro also thinking he's got some bigger fish to fry. I don't know if he knows the situation on the road. Of course, that that digital uh, probably, digital yeah. sign the riders get, it's only got room for one time gap, and uh, who knows who's where, you know? He, he won't know exactly who he's where on the road, so um, I think he's, uh, in his head, it will probably be just about maximizing the pace of this final climb, and uh, at the moment, he's doing that by sitting on the wheel of Pelitari. I certainly think that's the case. Um, when in doubt, um, you know how far to go, will have all the information on his head unit, but what he won't be getting, as you just said, is information from the team car. They're not on radios, but we are now on to the final climb. 3.8 k's to go for our leading trio of riders. We're leading three riders who are up the road, um, but they are split by about 10 seconds at the moment. Meanwhile, further down this horribly steep climb that will bring the Tour de l'Avenir to a close, it is the defending yellow jersey, the Mayo Jean Matthew Riccatello of the United States of America, of America, just doing what he can. He's come under attack, left, right and centre, isolated, no teammates with him over the top of the Col de Isera, um, but not descending quite as quickly as others, but on the climbs, he's given it all he had, and this is going to be, well, a race of truth, a time trial to the top. He's going to dig as big a hole as he can for himself, put himself in the hurt locker to try and shut this gap down. And this is the man in the polka dot jersey who poses the major threat. The man who took the queen stage of this race from Mexico, 19 years of age, an absolute sensation, burst onto the scene. 
And this is a thriller because we've got a pursuit just behind as well. Archie Ryan is closing the gap with Jan Christian too here, Jens. Yeah, and what we don't know is exactly where that, that third group on the road is, uh, although it's not quite the third group on the road, but the third relevant group on the road, I think. Yeah. With uh, with Piganzoli and with Matisse Rondel, the, uh, the other riders who are out there in the GC, uh, they were reported at 1 minute and 10 seconds on the top of the previous climb. Uh, but we don't quite know where they are right now. I think at this point, though, it looks like Del Toro and, uh, and Pigonzoli are going to fight for the stage win. I think Lacerre has just disappeared from that group uh, out the back. Um, but it's it's looking like Del Toro is, uh, is pretty certain for the overall win, unless Brigatello does something magical on this final climb. But who finishes second in GC? It's uh, it's going to be between the two Italians, Pigonzoli, Belizari, and maybe still Brigatello, depending on how, uh, how fast he goes up this hill. Yep, I thought the... Um the Belgian was still in front, but he isn't. But we didn't see him caught, but he's certainly been spat straight out of the back because Isaac Del Toro now um, isn't thinking about the rider on his wheel. Uh, Giulio Pelizzari poses no threat to him. He sits at two minutes and seven seconds, unless, of course, Pelizzari can drop him by the best part of a minute, which I don't think is going to happen. Meanwhile, Josh Golica, one of the few surviving members of the early break of the day, are now being caught. And it looks as if Matthew Riccitello is now on his own, an individual pursuit, pursuit to try and ride this, this climb as fast as he can. A little look across there from Pelizzari, who's willing to help out Del Toro here. Yeah, Pelizzari also, of course, riding for his place in the GC. He's, uh, he's only two minutes behind uh, on Riccitello, and we're looking there at that gap that says Peloton, but, uh, but there is no Peloton on the road anymore. So I'm just going to assume that is the gap to Riccitello, and if that's the case, it's two minutes and 30. Uh, that means that Pelizzari might be picking up a podium here. It certainly looks like it. What can Riccitello do? He is uh, in a lot of difficulty at the distance behind and these gaps the gap with uh, the archie ryan opened up with yang christian it went at a moment when riccicello was uh, was hesitating drop back to take a, a beat on you can't criticize the riders it's a it's a, a racing moment but it just shows how cruel it is but now this man is on his own him against himself him against the mountain out of the saddle again forcing the pace as hard as he can it's going to be about seven or eight minutes of pure pain for matthew riccatello what can he do here the man from the united states of america urged on here by the man at the side of the road and these are the riders that he's fighting against the slope really starting to bite now this is a brutally steep climb here Jens. Yeah, this is one of the steepest sections, but they're going to get into a slightly flatter section here. Uh, it just flattens off there, but then it kicks up immediately. We're going to get a section of 15% for a couple hundred meters at two kilometers to go. Uh, the, the top of the climb is going to be a little bit flatter, but I'm just uh, seeing this timing point here. This is with three kilometers to go, one minute and 20 seconds for Ryan and, uh, and Young Kiston. Uh, we think that Lasser is, uh, is still in between, maybe someone else. I think... Uh, those two might be uh, fourth and fifth on the road then, and behind them, I think we just saw Peri, uh, no, not Peri, Zai, Piganzoli, the other uh, Italian, uh, who was just a little bit behind uh, those two chasers, Ryan and uh, and Kirsten. But it's a confusing situation they're out on the road. Yep, so uh, this race is all over the place as Riccitello moves through. And we've also got another rider coming through. This is a Piganzoli. He appears to be riding across the gap now to Archie Ryan and Jan Christian of Switzerland. So um, they've now, mo or is he getting dropped? It's difficult to say. I think he's actually closing the gap now, but Christian now dropping Ryan here. So Ryan, Christian, and uh, Piganzoli. Christian dis dis distancing himself now from the Irishman, who looks as if he's starting to struggle a little bit, but meanwhile, up in front, it is Del Toro on the front. It's a, a very narrow little back lane, isn't it? And a rutted surface picking its way through the mountains here but Riccitello jersey fully unzipped is fighting his own personal battle here you've got to admire the tenacity of this man he's really been up against it today but now this is just man against man isn't it yeah we just saw that three kilometer point again with uh, with Riccitello coming through there two minutes and 37 seconds behind the leaders so the gap is really really going out there and that gives us a virtual GC with Del Toro clearly ahead uh, the two Italians, Pelizzari and Pigonzoli, are basically equal on time now on the road. So uh, that's still a battle to look out for. And, uh, and Riccitello, yeah, that means that he's slightly behind those two on the, on the virtual GC. So it could, it's still hanging in the balance. But I think Riccitello might even be losing out on a podium finish on the general classification here. 
And he's mopping up a lot of other people on the mountain. Um, but the lead, as you say, is moving away from him. Uh, Ryan now has been caught, and it looks like he's about to be passed now by Piganzoli. Christian, 50 or so metres up the road there, just riding his own rhythm. And on these sorts of slopes, it's difficult to actually follow riders. You have to ride at your own rhythm when the gradient gets above 8 9%. But uh, this duo in front are uh, riding pretty equally, sharing the pacemaking because there is so much to gain. There's the stage win, and then there's the overall honour of winning the Tour de l'Avenir. And winning the Tour de l'Avenir was something this man believed he could do coming into this stage, but it's been a very difficult challenge for him today. He's come up against it, he really has, but uh, despite that, he has fought with every single fibre in his body. But as has this man too. He's riding intelligently, he's riding strongly, and he looks pretty calm right now as well, Jens. Yeah, I think both of these riders looking fairly calm still with two kilometers on the road. That means that we're coming up to that really steep portion of about 15% with this climb of steep portions all over it. I, uh, these two riders, of course, still second year under 23, so there's four years uh, in this category. And they're still on the younger side of this, uh, this category. Ricatello is the uh, third year under 23. Um, but we've got two really young talents who are, uh, are looking to dominate this final stage. It certainly looks like they're going to make it 1.9 kilometers to go as Giulio Pelizzari moves through to the front. Started the day in fourth place overall at 2 minutes and 7 seconds. The man on his wheel now out of the saddle in the polka dot jersey. I've said his name enough. He needs no introduction really, Isaac Del Toro. Started the dead only 54 seconds behind the Mayo Jorn of Matthew Riccatello. is now a couple of minutes further back down the mountain and looking like he's going to lose the yellow jersey today. Oh, what a ride it's been. What an explosive stage. A relatively short stage today. The final stage of this, the 59th edition of the Tour de l'Avenir. 99.6 Ks. We started in Valcini, Termignon. And we're going to finish this wonderful race off at the top of saint foy Tarentaise. Who is going to take the stage as they move on to the main road here? The Italian on the front, the Mexican in his wheel. They continue to look round, but it does look as if this two, with the gap that they've built, the gap that they've earned, the gap that they fought for, is going to be between these two now, Jens. Yeah, there is a report out there with uh, that puts William Junior Lazare at only 15 seconds. So that means that there is still a chance that he could come back if the front two riders start looking at each other. But the chances of that happening uh, aren't too great. Billy Zari has a reason to ride for uh, for that second place on the road against his teammate Piconzoli. Uh, they're roughly equal on time in the in the virtual GC. Uh, and Del Toro will definitely keep riding for his overall win now, uh, I think. So it's uh, it's still all to play for, but I think it's going to be between these two for the stage win. It certainly looks like it. They need to keep a run. They can't actually afford to ease up anyway, can they, because of the GC, just in case Riccatello rides a scintillating last few kilometers. Um, they don't want to open the door to La Surf. That's going to make it a little bit harder, but as the road starts to ease ever so slightly, that's where there is an opportunity to come back. But 15 seconds is a big ask um, for the Belgian. He went clear at the bottom, using the momentum, using that craft he has on the descent as Riccatello now picks past. Looks like he's going past Joshua Golikan out. Jersey flapping on the climb. Nobody in sight. A desperate situation for Matthew Riccatello. But it's still in front. It is Mexico and Italy. This duo have blown this race apart. They went on the offensive over the top of the Col de Isaran. They continued it in the Valley Roads. They punched up the Monte de Villare. They dropped everybody behind them and now are battling it out for the stage win. And for the Mexican in front, the honor of possibly taking the overall win in the Tour de l'Avenir. What a sensational race this has been so far. Yeah, so just an overview of the situation on the road. It's those two leaders, Del Toro and, uh, and Belizari. I think Lacer is just behind. I think it's still uh, Emre Zweistad who's there just ahead of that group that we just saw in pictures uh, with, uh, with Jan Kisten, uh, Archie Ryan and, uh, of course, Davide Piconzoli. And the yellow jersey is, uh, is way behind. There's still a few riders in between, but it's, it's definitely going to be between these two for the overall win, though, uh, uh, for the stage win, rather. And the overall win is definitely looking like it's going to go to Isaac Del Toro. Yeah, Pelizzari uh, on the wheel now of Isaac Del Toro. Pelizzari has had a great run of uh, results at the back end of this race. Fourth on stage, sick. 
six, fourth on stage seven, third yesterday. Can he back it up with a win today as he moves through to the front himself? He'll be moving himself, securing that position on the podium. Is willing to help the man that just sat on his wheel as they both fight their bikes as they come into the closing stages of this race. 500 metres to go now on the final stage of the Tour de l'Avenir. What a race it has been. It's exploded all over the mountains. We are in the Alps, of course, and Matthew Riccatello looks as if he is going to unfortunately lose the Tour de l'Avenir. But who is going to take the stage today atop the saint foy the Tarantais? They come in to the finishing straight. It is Isaac Del Toro leading out. It looks as if this is going to open the door for Pelizzari. Giulio Pelizzari, he comes round the Mexican to take a well-deserved stage win. And there it is. Pelizzari takes the win for Italy. Punches the air with absolute delight. And the clock starts now del toro in second place but i do think it's going to be impossible now for riccatello to salvage the jersey yeah it was almost uh, he almost gave it away there at the end by sitting up slightly too early we've already seen that this uh, this week of course but uh, but Pelitari takes a great stage win and i think he's going to take second in over in the overall general classification as well with uh, with del toro almost certain of his overall win now we see the clock in the on the bottom right of the screen the Sarah finishes 30 seconds back uh, which is also going to put him up uh, in the classification but we'll uh, we'll have to see exactly where he finishes indeed the surf good ride by him start of the day six at 344 i don't think we're even inside the final kilometer now um, it won't be too far, but uh, Matthew Riccatello um, only started the day with a 54 seconds lead. He's got with him for company Joseph Blackmore at the moment. I think Joseph Blackmore appears to be suffering himself. And meanwhile, uh, I think this is one of the surviving members of uh, the breakaway coming through. That looks like Svestad Barsang uh, coming in. And just behind him, Jan Christian of Switzerland and also Archie Ryan too. It looks like they've also got Piganzoli with them for company. But the Svestad Barsen crosses the line there. Absolutely spent. Archie Ryan, yesterday's stage winner, just finishes in ahead of Christian. And then it is Piganzoli who just stops the clock there. Just finishing inside the top ten as well. The clock continues to tick. So the overall win has now gone. Um, subject to confirmation, of course. One minute and 37 seconds. We've still got around 500 metres to go for Matthew Riccatello. But the win, incredibly, um, the overall classification has fallen, has been earned, in fact, by Isaac Del Toro of Mexico. What a moment for Mexican cycling. Yeah, incredible moment for Mexican cycling. Uh, it has all turned around on that final stage. Uh, and I think if there's no penalties or, or other time uh, time differences that we uh, we see after the fact, the general classification has in fact gone to Del Toro. And uh, it's definitely out of the hands of Riccatello because he's now lost uh, lost third place as well. Pelizari will finish in second. Piconzoli will finish in third. And uh, Riccatello uh, will most likely take uh, third uh, fourth place in the, in the general classification. So Isaac Del Toro is looking back. The consistency he had this year has been sensational. It really, really has as the, as the riders continue to finish it. Well, this is a Blackmore finishing. And here is Matthew Riccatello, the deposed leader, finishes two minutes and 46 seconds down. His jersey unzipped, nothing more than he can do. He gave it absolutely everything out of the road but wasn't enough of a match for this man who i think it's fair to say at only 19 years of age has become one of the hottest properties in world cycling yeah we generally see it with the younger riders who win uh, to 11 years they go on to do great things it's the slightly older winners who uh, is still usually turn pro and do uh, do solid performances as professionals but that highest echelon of, uh, of riders tend to come through so quickly uh, it was Pogacar Bernal they've all won a second year under 23s and uh, he does all just puts himself in that list of, uh, of winners yep it's uh, his 10th overall in the, the peace race 10th overall in the Cebu cycling tour third in the Jewish Ciclista della Valle de Aosta this year and has now come to the Tour de l'Avenir and uh, won a stage and won the overall general classification and this is Pinzon he just rolls through the line for Colombia 
What a spread all over the mountain today. A relatively short stage, 99.6 kilometers. But what a day it has been. The general classification essentially turned on its head. And the man that posed the biggest threat to Riccicello at the start of the day has ultimately ended up as the winner and proved himself to be the strongest and the most intelligent man in this race. It'll be interesting to look back and hopefully we'll find out in a bit of a debrief, Jens, at what point the attack went, at what point Riccatello uh, was dropped by Del Toro. Was it over the top or the ears around or was it on, on the descent? That remains to be seen. But once he was isolated there, he just came under so much attack that there was there's very little he could actually do. But I think what we did see out on the road, bar for the, 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 um, the bit where he was exposed, he rode on the climb, that's all he could do, but he had no assistance at all. Exactly. A difficult day. Oh, on the anyway. biggest race under 23, do you really realize it? I don't know what I want to say. It's this is unbelievable. Eight days ago, I don't know. This is more big than me. Ye yellow jersey, green jersey, white jersey, king of mountain. It's historical. Well, there you go, folks. That's what it means to win this race. This is too much for me, to be honest. It's, uh, this is too much. Well, there you go. This lad lost for words. I think I am, to be honest with you. Coming to terms with the enormity of his win there. Powerful emotional moments there in, a, in what has been a very difficult week for cycling. But this sport continues to be guileless, doesn't it? it it's, it's such a beautiful sport. Um, the powerful emotions and, and the significance of, of the dominance of the winner. Stage win, the overall. And as the gentleman just poured it out, he's won every single classification. It's incredible. Yeah, it's an incredible moment for him for for global cycling. I would say it's uh, it's just proof that you can you can come from a long way away. You don't have to be from one of those traditional cycling countries. If you've got talent and you've got the mentality to work hard, you can you can attain these sorts of uh, victories. And uh, Del Zorro, he's he's just dominated this race. He's uh, he's been strong really from day one. We saw it on on the stage four that he uh, he attacked from far out, almost held on for the stage win, didn't quite get it on that day. Uh, but after that, he rode a smart race, but he rode especially strong uh, across the whole whole race. And he also lost two minutes in that team time trial, we mustn't forget, because uh, yeah, that, yeah. Was, uh, that was not a great day for the Mexican team. He, he didn't have the strongest time trials with him, but uh, he managed to, uh, to rise above that team time trial performance and, uh, and win the, the overall general classification. Yeah, an impressive win. There is the stage result of the final stage of this year's Tour de l'Avenir. And what an addition it has been. Giulio Pellizzali takes the win for Italy. Isaac Del Toro in second. William Junior Le Cerf of Belgium in third. Then we had Embret Svestad Barsang surviving from the early break from Norway in fourth. Archie Ryan, another good ride by the Irishman in fifth. Then we have Jan Christian, David Piganzoli, Kraps uh, in eighth place. So, a brilliant, brilliant race. And here's the moment that the race was won. The stage, of course, by the young Italian, who looks absolutely delighted in the white jersey there, just ahead of Adele Toro. But, um, whew. Oh, man. A little bit emotional after that, uh, Jens. Uh, just a, a brilliant, brilliant race. And um, I hope everybody at home has enjoyed it. Did you enjoy the last week? I certainly have, mate. Absolutely, it's it's always a nice thing to watch this race. Uh, usually, we only get the last couple stages. This week, we got the whole race, uh, so we got to see this whole whole array of uh, of different talents uh, who are going to turn pro next year. But first, we're going to listen the, to the stage Italy, I think. The greatest race uh, under 23. Yes, it's an incredible day. Today, we want to uh, win this day, and. Uh, 
we give all uh, for this uh, beautiful day. Isaac uh, is very the best uh, today. Yes, he's, uh, he's very strong. I know him uh, from uh, uh, two years and uh, I... Uh, yes, he's the strong. <laughs> Thank you. Fair play. It was good to see these uh, these youngsters speaking multiple languages as well. And uh, I think we'll be seeing a lot more of that young man as well. Clearly, he's known him for a while. And we're talking about our race winner, Isaac Del Toro. And just looking at the races that they've done uh, over the last um, year or so as well, I would imagine. And they'd have uh, raced as juniors together. And then his first year under 23s as well. Uh, whether we'll see Isaac Del Toro in the under 23 category next year remains to be seen. Um, I think it's almost academic that it will be moving up. Um, and uh, let's wait and see what happens over the next um, the next couple of weeks, because that's a name that I think some of the biggest teams will want amongst their roster, um, without wanting to make any predictions, of course. But um, for the time being, uh, Del Toro can just reflect. Um, he's going to be the only man on the podium, <laughs> which um, I think, as, as a presenter was saying, I think that might be the first time that has ever happened. As we look at the uh, result again, Belazari, Del Toro, Le Serp, Svestad, Barsing, Ryan, Christian, Piganzoli, Krabs, Pescador, Castro, and uh, Mathis Rondel of France, the French, Frenchman home there in that left group of three. That's two minutes and 12 seconds. Some to cheer for, for the home crowd. waiting for a few more riders to come home before we get confirmation of the exact look of the top 10. Uh, undoubtedly, of course, we know who our winner is, but there'll be uh, quite a lot of movement at the top end as well and quite a few riders losing places, a few gaining places. Um, but then, um, what's been your biggest takeaway, Jens, as we wait for the results to come up from this year's Tour de l'Avenir? I mean, um, what's been um, the bit that you've, uh, you've liked the most or the most intriguing? I don't know. I think just being introduced to a rider like Delto, I'm, I'm sure we're going to see him in that highest echelon of riders uh, over just a couple uh, couple of years. We'll see him right there. Um, but oh well, this is uh, this is the overall general classification. Here we go. So we should take a look at that. Indeed. Well, uh, Del Toro, as we know, t has taken the win, a historic win for uh, for Mexico ahead of uh, Giulio Pelizzari in second. Italy also taking third step on the podium with David Piganzoli at 142. Unfortunately for Matthew Riccatello, he's moved down to fourth despite a valiant ride. Then we have Le Cerf, Rondel, Christian Svestad, Barsing, Dalby and Joseph Blackmore for Great Britain moving himself into the top ten but at a distant ten minutes and 15 seconds underlining the dominant performance by the 19-year-old Mexican factoring in the fact that Jens was talking about earlier on. He lost two minutes in the uh, team time trial. But that's uh, done nothing for the overall performance at all. Absolutely superb win as riders continue to file across the line. And some decent climbers in that little clutch of riders. 12 minutes and 32 seconds. Highest point reached on the Col d'Israël in this year's Tour de l'Avenir as well. 2,700 metres. It's been a tough, tough day of racing. A tough week of racing over different sorts of terrain from the start in Brittany last Sunday. Uh, I'm wondering if we might be joining the podium. We'll just have to wait and see what our pictures show up for us here. But no, I do agree with your point there, Jens. Um, I think seeing the emergence of a major new talent is what the Tour Lavin is all about. It's the race of the future. Um, but also to see that that, uh, that powerful interview at the end, uh, just to see him coming to terms with, with, um, with what it means for him, for the race itself, but for Mexican cycling, um, quite profound, actually. Yeah, and I think, well, the other takeaways we can see, there's always uh, all the stage winners, or almost all the stage winners anyway, end up on, uh, on World Tour contracts, and, uh, and most of the top ten also do in the uh, general classification. Uh, and it's not just those riders, it's anyone who really who really shows any uh, anything special as we see the general classification again. Uh, anyone who's shown anything of, uh, worthy of note will be picked up on by, uh, by some of the scouts of the World Tour teams, of the pro teams. 
um, anyone who's, who's shown something. It, it doesn't need to be a really consistent performance or anything. It could just be uh, just one moment of uh, really strong domestic work for another rider. Those those things are going to be picked up on, and uh, or a strong breakaway or, or anything like that. Uh, the teams will be watching, uh, and and all those uh, those riders can end up somewhere because it's it's not about that that consistent performance. It's not about the whole week. Uh, it's about those flashes of brilliance that you sometimes pick up on, uh, and there's there's been quite a few of those over this week. Yeah, there's been plenty. Uh, it's been a magnificent week of racing, it really has. We've had uh, breakaways, we've had team time trials, individual time trials, bunch sprints, although we only had one of those. Well, let's look back on what has been an exceptional day's racing, a real celebration of what bike racing is all about, in its rawest form, in fact, in the under-23 class. Unpredictable, difficult to know what's going on, difficult racing to control as well, and over some of the harshest terrain possible. Well, the early breakaway, it was uh, Imbred Svestad Barseng who went clear for Norway, and with him for company, he took Joshua Golica. And it was Golica, in fact, just took the points and the prize over the top of the highest point of this year's Tour de l'Avenir, the Col de Isera, 2,700 metres above sea level. They then began at the plummet down the other side. But in the interesting chasing group that formed just behind was Isaac del Toro and Giulio Pelizzari. And also in the mix as well was uh, William Junior Le Cerf of Belgium. The two out in front persisted, but this was the chasing trio. At this point, the yellow jersey Matthew Riccicello was around 30 seconds behind in a bunch. Another couple of riders catapulted themselves across briefly in Aquasis Palin and Ivan Romeo, the winner of a stage five, just latching himself onto the back of the group. But meanwhile, Riccatello of the United States of America in the yellow jersey was completely and utterly isolated. In fact, several riders clipped across and ultimately were to join the swelling group out in front. As we headed on to the penultimate climb of the day, the Monte de Villaret, the attacks continued to come. There was a brief break in the front group, but that was sewn together pretty quickly by Isaac del Toro. Then another move came up from the peloton, this time containing the Swiss rider, Jan Christian, looking to move himself up a little bit in the general classification. On to the slopes of the final climb of the day, the brutally harsh slopes of the saint foy du Tarentais. 8.7% average over five kilometres just under, and it was Del Toro who continued to force the pace, putting everybody else under a lot of pressure. And the first to fall away was Svestad Barseng, struggling just at the back there adding to his tally in the King of the Mountains classification. He crested the penultimate climb of the day in front. Briefly, we had the Belgian Le Cerf in front, taking the descent with a little bit more pace, and then behind with undoubted pace, chasing, desperately trying to hold on, to cling on to his yellow jersey, whether a Matthew Riccitello. As we got deeper and deeper into the final climb of the day, it was becoming pretty apparent who was the strongest man in this race. It was indeed the man from Mexico who took a historic win on the overall, but the stage was to go to Pelizzari of Italy. So Italy took the stage, but an historic win for Mexico in this wonderful race. The sprint behind from the man from that was Blackmore, and then coming in just behind but unfortunately tumbling down the general classification, in fact, just falling off the podium, ultimately finishing in fourth place on the GC was Matthew Riccatello. Despite his valiant efforts, it wasn't quite good enough on the day. So there is the confirmation of the stage that wraps up this year's Tour de l'Avenir, Pelizzari taking the win. And as a result, this was the final look, the final shape of the GC, Del Toro taking the win, Palazzari and Piganoli on the podium there, Piganzoli should I say on the podium for Italy, Ricatillo down to fourth, Le Cerf up to fifth, Rondel, Christian, Svestad, Barseng, Dolby and Blackmore. So the picture postcard views at saint foy Tarentes as our field continue to file across the line. No doubt there'll be a nice party at the Polish hotel, at the, at the Mexican hotel today. Del Toro joined by his teammates, Carlos Garcia, Michael Zariate and Jose Muniz.